breaking the wall of internet censorship. How peer-to-peer -peer wireless mesh networks are replacing centralized connectivity. Aaron Catlin, founder of Funkfeuer Freenet, Vienna. As a 14-year-old in 1989, I felt a wave of change was coming. I remember my parents being afraid of atomic energy during the 80s, but not on the 9th of November. At that time, I was already experimenting with IT technology, and even as a 14-year-old, it was clear to me that our digital computers and networks would never tolerate these walls anymore. So, thank you very much for having me here. Um, it's a great honor, and uh, actually I'm a little bit shocked almost to, to talk about my hobby project, which is just a hobby project, it's not my daytime job. Uh, just something that we started uh, as a group uh, nine and a half years ago, and um, it, you know, it carried on since then, and there uh, has been this driving motor behind this all the time. So. I don't know exactly if I deserve this, being here, but anyway, I hope you bear with me. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm not probably the first one to have thought this, this idea that, you know, in, in when I was 14, um, the, the, east, the wall was falling, um, the, 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 the change was coming, and we a actually felt something new. I think if Bert Brecht in 1932 had a very similar idea that if we can have two-way communication systems, if people could talk back on the radio, the world would be a different place. So just imagine, what if every person in Germany, in Austria, and in Europe at that time uh, had a radio to talk back, maybe had a printing press, maybe had a cinema a studio? You know, we would have lots of parodies of the rise of fascism or so. And it would, the, the world would have been a different place. People wouldn't, wouldn't be able to follow blindly just one direction. So I think this multitude of opinions, this multitude of voices is really the core of what I'm, I'm, I want to talk about. So, we have good news for Mr. Brecht. We built that. By now, at least I believe so. It's in small scales. Uh, we have the internet, first of all. But the internet is still very centralized. It's frighten, frighteningly centralized. Um, the, you know, if you, if you look at your internet connection from your internet service provider, your internet service provider will give you uh, a DSL modem, and that will connect to some switch, and that switch will, as in a tree, have multiple other DSL modems connected to it. And it will be a very central place. So you knock out that place, you knock out many customers at once. Of course, then at the higher level, the level the ISP will cross-connect. However, we took a totally different approach here. As you can see in this graph of the uh, mesh network, this is uh, the sort of the center of, of our network here, the, the, the green stuff in the middle. And that has, that, th these are nodes, as in graph theory, nodes uh, describing essentially Wi-Fi routers. Small things like, like for example, this one. The standard Wi-Fi router that everybody can buy in a shop. It's nothing special, it's very cheap, it's 40 euros maybe, or less by now. And we can reprogram those and create this network of densely interlinked nodes. And these nodes are connected via edges, and on the edges you can see, you probably can't see, but there are labels, edge labels, say, saying how strong this connection is, how much packet loss we have, etc. So, this is sort of, you get the impression of the structure of the network. It's like a spider went crazy. There's no structure. But how did it all start? Uh, we started, as I said, in roughly 2003, 2002, in parallel to other groups, like many discoveries, these things happen in parallel, independently, and then, thanks to the internet, actually, we were able to exchange knowledge and just boosted our research. So, in Vienna, we had the Funkfeuer group. In Berlin, you have the Freifunk group, uh, which are doing very similar things and improving their technology since years. So, we started with uh, simple reprogrammable repro routers, and we put them into boxes and put them to the roofs, connected antennas to them, etc., and made them connect to each other. But how did it really start? We had this really nice experience of 
being a, in, a, in my office space at that time, we had multiple laptops. People installed this so-called mesh software on their laptops. And um, this software allowed the laptops to talk to each other directly. They didn't need any other infrastructure. Okay, no access point, no separate access point. The laptops would talk to each other. And they would, I'll explain it soon how this exactly works, but we realized, like, you know, one person was on that floor, the other one was in the, in the staircase, the third person was in the, in the floor below, and we realized we could actually communicate directly. And then it made click. We are the infrastructure. This is really the new discovery here, that we can, with very cheap mechanisms, create our own infrastructure. Okay. So by now, we're a little bit more professional. Um, you know, at least this guy has some protective stuff here. Um, and uh, please note the birds on the antenna. That's how you get them accepted. People love birds and pictures on antennas. Yeah. So uh, this, by the way, is the first, to my knowledge, uh, I might be wrong here, but to my knowledge, the first international community wireless link between two countries, between Austria, Styria, and Slovenia. And Slovenia by now has a connection to Croatia. And I know there is a wireless network in Serbia. So I want them to connect. This would be so symbolic. I would really love to see that very soon. OK. So where are we right now with Funkfeuer? Funkfeuer is now a network in Vienna, in Graz, and other parts of Austria. Um, and we have roughly 240 roofs, 600 devices on those roofs. Um, it connects vast areas. Essentially, if you want to have internet connectivity in Vienna and you have access to the roof level and you can see, because you need line of sight with the Wi-Fi signals, uh, you can connect to our network. You'll get access for free. All that we will ask you is to cross-connect to at least two other nodes. Okay, that's a very important property of the graph. Okay, the same has been repeated in other parts. But how does it really work? As I said before, we had this experiment with the laptops. How does it work? So you have here one of those Wi-Fi routers with our special mesh software installed. This software is called OLSR, Optimized Link State Routing. Um, and it's a typical representative of so-called um, Manet, uh, or the Americans usually call it, uh, pronounce it in a French way. I don't know why Manet. Anyway, it's, <laughs> it's Manet, uh, Mobile Ad Hoc Networking. Um, and this essentially allows this router here to talk with that one here on any path that it can choose. So how does it work? First, this one says, hi, I'm here. I have the address 10.93.1.52. And the other one will say, hi, I'm also here. I'm 10.93.1.3. Um, and over the course, they will repeat this. They will say hi all the time to each other. And over the course of the time, we have some statistics, how much packets are lost uh, during this conversation. So they will have some link quality here between them. And by the way, this one also tells this one, by the way, you can reach all these nodes here via me. So the router 10.93.152 will store this in his table, in his routing table, and essentially say, OK, whenever I want to go to that node here, to 10.93.1.10, I'll send it over 1.3. That's very simple. And this happens periodically. So essentially, our convergence time, until the network learns where every node is, is in the order of seconds. So you can move them around. It's absolutely no problem. You can put them on cars. You can put them on vehicles. You can put them on. Airplanes, whatever you, you like. Actually, I know that there, these, this, exactly this MANA technology is used in drones. Yeah? So it's very, it's not only us who is using that. So, but why do we do that? Um, for us, the main purpose is to have an independent mechanism of communication. Because when we're talking about breaking down the wall of censorship, actually what we're talking about is circumventing any wall, in any way that we can. And imagine this software now installed on smartphones in Tahir Square. Internet gets cut off, demonstration, GSM network gets cut off, but they still have Wi-Fi. They can still connect to each other. They can still transmit messages to each other. They can still stay connected. 
this becomes a very, very strong and important mechanism for organizing protest, for example. Everybody was talking about Facebook and the Arab Revolution, but Facebook is a very centralized system. If you don't get access to Facebook because your internet connection is turned off, what do you do? You can't do anything. But with this, actually, you can still stay connected. So I believe that in a democracy, it's, very, it's our very obligation to have independent paths of communication. So that I think that's why we do it. Okay. So, but as I said, we're not the only ones doing that. And we're not the only ones improving the mesh protocols. Uh, first of all, I mentioned already in Berlin, you have a very old and very strong group, the Freifunk community. And by the way, if you use the internet here in this room, you're connected over the Freifunk network. You didn't notice it, but actually it works. And in case one link fails, it will automatically switch to a different link. And you might notice some lag, but not very much. So, but we're not the only ones. Um, the best example that I know is in Spain. Well, my friends would say it's not Spain, it's Catalonia. And um, this is the whole region around Barcelona. And it has 18,000 nodes at the moment. Um, and they're growing exponentially. Essentially, what they're doing is they're, they're not so much focusing on circumvention, because we don't need that so much in Europe right now at the moment. They're focusing on bringing internet to the rural areas, which are underserved, where Telefonica is too expensive, or where the farmers think Telefonica comes from Madrid, and they want to have something from Barcelona. So, um, OK, so essentially, they connect the whole area there. And, uh, it's a very hilly area, so it's ideal for having an ascender on, on some hill and connecting the next town. Um, and this is extending this network in small pockets of networks all the way to uh, till Africa. There are ne Gifi net networks in Africa right now. Okay, same in Athens. Athens Wireless is 5,000 nodes. Um, it's essentially a network in itself. Internet access, in that case, is not even required. They have so many internal services, they provide so much for their own community, that they had to do a search engine for their services. So you don't have Google there, you have Google, wireless Google. Yeah? So um, they, the services range from anything from tracking um, ships till um, movies, whatever you want. Yeah? OK, so they also connect to, to islands, and uh, they're about to connect to the next largest network in Thessaloniki. That's, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe 500, 700 kilometers, something like that. Good. Another use case of these networks, as I said, in Europe at the moment, luckily, we don't need this circumvention approach. If you have the cable system here, use the cable system. It's just more reliable than wi any wireless system. But Recently, we saw where it was really practical in a disaster recovery area. This picture is taken from Red Hook in New York, which was hit by Sandy just recently. And this is Jonathan installing a <coughs> small and cheap Wi-Fi router. Thank you. Hey, I have a voice too. I can talk back. <laughs> um, so this was still operational after Sandy hit, and it gave people Wi-Fi access and needed access to communication to inform their relatives, etc. Why am I saying this? Because usually when a catastrophe hits, a natural catastrophe hits, our GSM-based networks survive only a certain period of time. You have generators, but they might be underwater. You have batteries, but they will last maybe only eight hours. So these, these systems are super uh, easy to install. They don't need much power. You can operate them with photovoltaic cells forever, and they just provide connectivity. So this talk wouldn't be great without elephants. <laughs> so David, thank you for the inspiration. Um, this is the Thai approach to having <coughs> mesh networks, um, and elephants are definitely very good for floods. OK, so that's pretty much for me. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs>